Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is Mike Munger, professor of economics and political science at Duke University. Mike, welcome back to Econ Talk. It's great to be here. Our topic today is recycling, uh, which is a uh, important piece of the environmental puzzle, and economics has a lot to say about it. Mike, you claim that recycling may have crossed over from an economically wise act to more of a religious impulse. What are you worried about? One of the things that worries me is that when we perform religious rituals, um, part of what's important is that we spend time on it. In fact, it's the, the very fact that we spend time that means that we're religiously devout. So, for example, many people don't work on the Sabbath uh, and the point is not that they're wasting time, but that the time has an e- even higher purpose. What bothers me about recycling is that I actually had a conversation with a, a woman in Massachusetts. I won't say what city because I think it would – well, <laughs> with a woman in Massachusetts who could was – could be public, Michigan it, it, it could or be, Wisconsin. Or, all sorts of states. It just happened to be that this was in Massachusetts. Possibly. And she told me that recycling is cheaper regardless of the cost. It's quite a claim. I – I, I found myself silent at that point. I wasn't sure how to respond. Yeah, what do you think she meant? Well, I think that, that she meant that it's it's a moral imperative, and it, it's it's religious in that sense. It's something that you have to do, and it doesn't really matter how much it costs. Again, like religion, because what I had tried to propose to her was it's an economics version of 20 questions, but since time is valuable, it really only is two questions. I have something in my hand. I want you to guess. Is it a resource or is it garbage? That's, a great, you get that's to ask a great me, game. You get, you get to ask me questions about it. Can I play? Please, let's play it now. I have something in my hand. Is it garbage or is it a resource? This reminds me a little bit of the Woody Allen uh, short story where he plays um, Scrabble via mail. It's a pre-email <laughs> um, short story, and each player is – the whole idea of it's amusing, of course, because you're supposed to be drawing tiles randomly and then removing tiles that your opponent has used to make it fair. Uh, but we'll play 20 questions. I'm a little bit nervous, though, because we're doing this by phone, as our listeners can probably tell. And I I, I don't want to question your integrity, Mike, but if, if I guess it right off, you, you might just say, no, it's something else. But I'll trust you. I'll take a chance. I think you can trust that I'll say, no, it's something else. That's right. <laughs> Okay, so you've got something in your hand. Is it a resource or is it garbage? Yeah, and you, you don't have to guess what it is. You just have to tell me which of those two things it is. Okay, so I'm going to play naively for a little bit. Okay, so It's my, a rule you find natural. It is. Right, here's my naive beginning. Here we go. Is it pretty? Somebody might think so. Um, does it taste good? Can you eat it? I can't. Mm, not very helpful. <laughs> is it bigger than a bread box? It's smaller than a bread box. Okay, so it's something small. Uh, uh, did you buy it? I didn't. Was it a gift? Yes. So somebody gave you something. I guess it still could be resource or garbage. It could be a gift of somebody dropping a an old news, flinging an old news. But I get. I don't know about you. I get one of those neighborhood newspapers tossed into my yard every uh, week. And and it's a gift. It's a gift, but it's garbage. Yeah. I don't open it. I don't even open it. I take it straight to either a holding area, pre-garbage holding area called my front porch, uh-huh. or it goes straight into the garbage. I, I think I think we're getting somewhere now because you're sort of asking, would someone pay me for it? Yeah. Would I? Would I? Well, yeah. I could ask a cheat a cheating question. Is this something you would throw out? But no, the question is, would somebody pay you for it? And I think the answer is no. Well, if somebody wouldn't pay you for it, I guess my answer would be it's not a resource. It's uh, garbage. We're, we're, we're not quite there yet. I think there's one more question you'd need to ask. Which is? And that would be, could I make something with it that cost less or had higher quality 
that than something else that, that looked like this. So right. either... Could you transform it into yep, something well, valuable? Will somebody pay me for it as it stands, or can I make something with it that either costs less or has higher quality? If the answer to both of those things is no, it's not a resource. It's garbage. Okay. And how does that, what does that have to do with recycling? Well, the question is, I have this thing that I want to recycle. The question is, is it, is it resource or is it garbage? Now, there are some things that somebody will pay me for, like aluminum. Copper wire. There's all sorts of things that, corrugated uh, cardboard in some cases. Your Look, car. It's, maybe not my well, car. Well, okay, but most <laughs> people's car. Yeah, most people's cars, it, it, has, it has some value, even if all you're going to do is melt it down and reuse the parts. Correct. So if it's garbage, though, I have to pay someone to take it, or if I make something with it, it costs more or has lower quality. Okay. And most of the stuff that we recycle is garbage. We, we just spend more doing it. It ends up being thrown away in so some form. Let's take a particular, a particular example. Uh, I think some people like the idea of recycling because, after all, waste is bad. And so when we recycle, we like the idea that when we put this stuff out at the curb uh, – let me, let me step back, actually. Let's talk about two types of recycling. Everybody recycles, and uh, m most of what we recycle is obviously a resource. So, for example, I wear my clothes more than once, right? Yeah. I, I could throw them away. Uh, I could say, well, they're dirty now. It's not worth cleaning them. I'll just go buy some more, and I could throw them away. But we don't do that. We recycle them. We, re we clean them up. We put them on again. Then when they get torn... Uh, or, or stained, we, we might recycle them in subtler ways. Well, we ask ourselves a question then. How much will it cost to clean or repair this? If and, it's too much, we throw it away. And we also then might decide it's too much to bring it back to its pristine state, but it's good enough for the weekend. So uh -huh. I can patch my knees or I can sew up badly a, a tear or I can wear a stained shirt, uh, which happens from time to time. Those, those, those things that I have tend to disappear when I'm not home because my wife throws them away. Is that your theory? <laughs> you never really that are shirt gremlins. It could be gremlins. You probably never – have you ever – you know, do you have any empirical I evidence? I have no proof. I have okay. no evidence at all. i got to step back from my claim. It could be the dryer. A lot of things <laughs> seem to never emerge from the dryer once they're put in. Everyone knows that. Uh -huh. uh, socks are commonly <laughs> So, So we've got – a lot of things in our lives that we recycle, we reuse. We make those choices about almost everything we touch. But there's this special thing, and it's funny because it's what we call recycling in, in the common parlance, which is really cans, bottles, newspaper, plastic stuff that we put in special bins usually out on the curb. And that's what we call recycling. And I think to go back to your 20 questions – we think of that as recycling as a resource when you're, su you're suggesting maybe we ought to think about it as garbage, which is discouraging, I think, to the people and perhaps depressing to the people who see it as a resource. I mean, after all, you put it out on the curb, you put your, your, um, your grass clippings or your bottles and cans or your newspaper uh, with the expectation that it's going to be reused just like your clothes are washed and reused or the aluminum uh, siding or the copper wire in your house is going to be reused even if your house is torn down. People always save that stuff, the copper wiring or pipes, for example, because copper is so valuable. Uh -huh. It's a resource. It's a resource. So what's different aren't – I mean, isn't you're, – you're suggesting that the cans and bottles and paper that I put out, just because somebody doesn't pay me for them, just because I donate them to the recycling center, that they're not a resource? It, it, in fact, I feel even more virtuous about that. I don't feel virtuous about reusing my tuxedo. I have a tuxedo. I don't throw it away. I send it to the dry cleaners, and I use it again. I don't feel virtuous about that. But I do feel virtuous about sorting my cans and bottles, taking and making an effort not to put them into the garbage bags, but putting them in the special yellow container that I then put out by the curb. And I have to admit, sometimes when I take my recycling out to the curb, I, I dawdle for a moment, look around. I hope some neighbor sees me because I'm doing something that's good for the environment. You're such a swell citizen, Mike. <laughs> well, and the reason I know it's good is that nobody's paying me to do it. That's the sign that it's virtuous. I'm doing it just because it's the right thing to do. It's a moral imperative. Yeah, it's not being tainted by the filthy uh, coin of commerce. No, no self-interest at all. 
Okay. Our, well, our listeners are probably getting worried and unclear about which of this is sarcasm and which is real. So let, let's back up for yeah, you a sec. Can, you can tell if I'm being sarcastic, my lips are moving. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Big help. <laughs> big help. Uh, when we get on HDTV, we'll, that'll be uh, a lot easier to determine. Um, you claim you're being virtuous, and I think you're being sarcastic. So, so why? No, I actually it? feel it. That's the strange thing, is even knowing what I know, I feel virtuous when I take that stuff out there. And the question is, what's going to happen to it? Should, you feel, people, should you feel virtuous? That's the question. Well, am I entitled? Is there any entitlement there to feel virtuous? Yes. I think most people actually think there's a utilitarian basis, and that is they're saving the environment. What they mean is... By recycling, they're using fewer resources. They're having a smaller impact on the environment or else they're using up fewer resources than if they just put it in the big garbage bags and didn't recycle. So there's a utilitarian basis. It's not just a moral thing like when I go to church and don't work on Sunday and and waste time. I spend time. This is spending time that has a utilitarian basis. It makes the world better off. It's stewardship of the environment. And you're suggesting that might not be true. I'm suggesting that it's really hard to tell that it's true. That's the reason that I often stand alone at parties. <laughs> I don't know the answer. The answer, you'd have to ask some questions. Will somebody pay you for this? And then why is that relevant? Because if somebody will pay me for it, it means that this uses fewer resources than doing it some other way. Suppose that my choice is I can make aluminum cans by mining bauxite and then using a large quantity of electricity to separate that bauxite, the aluminum ore, from the rock that it lives in, and then making cans. Or I could take aluminum cans and melt them down. And the first seems so expensive. It it, it seems so expensive. Because you've got to get it out of the ground, and you've got to use the electricity, and the cans are already out. Yep. So how could it possibly be that the second might be more expensive? It, it, It turns out that aluminum has an actual value, and recycling aluminum has the impact of using fewer resources than mining new bauxite. So that one we, we give a smiling puppy dog. Aluminum is a resource. Aluminum cans are a resource. Up to a point. I mean, you, you have to they have to be relatively clean and. Uh, well, but there's, there's there's you've 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 caught me. You've caught me telling a fib. It isn't just that they have to be relatively clean. Um, 65% of aluminum cans were recycled in 1992. Only 48% of aluminum cans were recycled in 2002. Do you have a suspicion about the reason? No, I don't. So you're telling that the proportion of cans that are recycled... Excuse Fallen me. dramatically. I've mean, I, I got to be careful here. What's the base? Is it the proportion of cans that are that are new have come from recycled or the proportion of cans that are used that are re- then reused? Because it's not the, the same the thing. The proportion of cans purchased in any given year containing anything. Okay. Um, it was that 65% were recycled. Now only 48% are recycled. So a higher proportion of aluminum cans from whatever source are going into landfills than before. Really? And why, why is that? Because aluminum cans are 52% lighter the incentives to reduce the amount of aluminum in each can has gone up so much that it's no longer really true that it's worth most people's time to collect aluminum. Used to be you would see guys in cities with stolen or maybe just borrowed grocery carts walking along taking aluminum cans out of garbage. Because that was a job. And it, because, because they, they were could a resource. make four or five cents a can. They weren't doing that to save the earth. They're doing it to save themselves. Nope, they're trying not to starve. Yep. And it was worth doing because if you could find enough of them, you could make a fair amount of money. That's almost not even worth the time of bums anymore. Because the cans are so thin, any one can has so little aluminum in it relative to the past, just not worth it. They'll pay, they'll pay very little. So if you have a large quantity of aluminum, yes. And if it's clean, um, so if time has no value, aluminum is still worth recycling. And if you can get a large quantity of it, yes. But the aluminum cans that I put out are worth far less than they used to be. It's very interesting. And it, it, it requires sorting. If there's any commingling of resources at all, if they have any iron cans or there's any plastic, or if for that matter, if there's just wrappers, it's not a resource. It's also worth mentioning that that, that change, I think I'm older than you, Mike. See, I, I was, uh, when I was a little boy, uh, someone would, you would show off by taking an aluminum can in your hand and crushing it. And the reason that was showing off is that most people couldn't do it. Yeah, it, or it would make a big sort of round can mark on your forehead. Yeah, the can itself. Not that has, I ever did it. No, no. <laughs> but the can itself, uh, 
Uh, I wasn't thinking of the head as part of the <laughs> trick. I was thinking of John Belushi. Then. No, I'm thinking of just holding it at arm's length and uh. giving it a squeeze. In, 1960, in the 60s, when I was a little boy, uh, that was something that a teenager would do to show off that he could crush a can with one hand. Uh-huh. And it wasn't that easy. No. No, most people couldn't do it. But a seven-year-old can do it today, maybe a five-year-old. It's it's hard not to. If you just put a little bit of weight on top of it, it'll, it'll crush. And what's interesting about that is that the can uh, has less aluminum, not because... Oh, it's love for the environment. It's, it's, it's not, the fact that these people love us. I'm sorry, but that's not the reason. <laughs> the reason is... Can is I try it, again? Yeah, aluminum's expensive. And it's in the self narrow self-interest of can makers to find ways to make cans that are thin. It's but, people like you who hate the earth. But don't collapse. <laughs> so, by the way, one other thing about this, I've talked to some people in the can business, so I'm, I'm glad we, we, can, we can use this rather uh, small bit of esoterica in my, in my knowledge set. Uh, the cans, if you look at a soda can today, you'll ha- it has that little fluted uh, lip at the top. Uh-huh. And it narrows ever so slightly at the top. And the reason for that is to allow it to support more weight than it otherwise would if it didn't have that. That narrowing is, is one way that they have figured out to have a can have less aluminum but still not collapse when stacked up. So, But you're right. Economic incentives have caused there to be less aluminum in cans per can. And that has made it less practical or rational to recycle. And in fact, people do recycle less, but it's still a sizable number for a pure religious impulse that throwing things out is bad. Yeah. Better to reuse them. It it has to be better to reuse it. There's just no way around it. And yet, The Economist has a quibble with that. What Uh is it? If I can find a way to to recycle it, to get them together in large quantities where I can make money doing it, then okay. So what... The, the, the quibble that I have with cities is that we put all these things out together in in the big yellow box. It's blue here, but go ahead. Uh, maybe it should be green some places. It should be. The problem that we have is that we're imposing all of the costs on the consumers. The only way that cities can make money by recycling aluminum is by making sure that all the sorting is done on the front end by consumers. And they'll go farther than that, not just sorting, but washing. The, the margin on recycling is so narrow that if things are just put out in their original dirty state, they've got paper covers, the city's going to lose money on it, and it's actually garbage that they're spending extra money to try to reuse. And to convert it to and, – and so uh, let, let's make sure that we, we, we make clear what the point here is. The point is that if it takes more resources to convert something that's used into something that's usable – it's better to throw it out and start from scratch. And that's just very difficult. You're making a normative claim that yeah. it's better. It's better. It's – let me say it differently then. Thank you. Let me, let, me, let me clarify that. And again, I want to make sure our listeners know when, when, when we're not being sarcastic. So sarcasm off here. Okay. We're going to be serious for a minute. Very serious. I'll, I'll say, when I say sarcasm on, you can revert to a normal, natural <laughs> state of nature. Uh, so sarcasm off. Uh, if – the city is losing money on recycling because it takes so much effort and so many machines to scrub and clean and remove labels from... Now compared to just putting it in the landfill. So yeah. the, the default option would be put everything in the landfill. It's because you would want to include that opportunity cost. Yes, yeah. it, it, it's not that that's that cheap. I was going to add a footnote for that, but okay. So that's correct. So you'd want to... Compared to the alternative of throwing away, if it's more expensive... To, to uh, turn it into something valuable than it is to throw it away, I said it's better. The correct, narrower statement that's accurate is recycling could use more resources than throwing away, which means that recycling exhausts precious things rather than conserves them. And therefore, this religious impulse we have not to waste, which is basically a good impulse, we actually can be wasting more when we recycle. Contrary to the, to the quote we have from your Massachusetts friend, which was, it's always better to recycle even when it's more expensive. The answer is that's not recycling, that's destroying. And, and the, how do we know that? 
it's because there are prices on all the resources that we're using. If it's more expensive, it's using more resources, provided that prices are right. So the economists, one of the reasons, again, we stand alone at parties is our basic impulse is to say, let's get prices right. And then people are going to make choices. I actually don't know what the correct choice is. Is it more expensive to mine aluminum or is it more expensive to make it out of cans? The answer is, Self-interested people are going to find out because they can make more money by doing it. Right. That's a, that's a very deep point. You don't really have to figure out whether you should recycle your cans or not. You should just look and see whether someone will pay you for it. Now, the only ca- – to take them. Instead, if you have to pay someone to take it away, as you pointed out at the beginning of this conversation, it's garbage. It's not a resource. It's not efficient. It's not productive. It's not conserving then to recycle. But let's be fair. Yep. The reason why landfill costs are so low is that if we charge the actual marginal cost of landfills, more people would dump illegally. So the argument that recycling people make is we can't actually charge the correct price for landfills, but we know it's a lot more expensive. It's hard to find. It's in there forever. There's all sorts of toxic waste. We don't want more landfills. Anything we do to keep it out of the landfill must be better. And you talking about cost means that you don't understand the fact that we're not really pricing landfills correctly. Yeah, let's back up and explain that a little more clearly. In in my city, uh, when I put out my garbage can, they take it. If I put out two garbage cans, they take it. If I put out three garbage cans, they take it. I don't pay extra for throwing more stuff away rather than less. That's always going to encourage me to throw stuff away. And so what, what many environmentalists claim correctly is that because landfill space, to me, the home, the home, the consumer, the landfill space, to me, is artificially low – That's always going to bias my choice toward throwing away rather than recycling. So some cities have responded to that. They've said, well, let's price landfills then. Let's not let people throw away stuff for free at the margin, meaning a little bit more, you should pay more. So some cities, I think, charge you by weight. Some charge you by volume. You get one can. If you want a second can, you have to pay a premium. That is, is the, the idea of that is to cause people to internalize, that is to take account of, the cost of throwing stuff away, and they shouldn't treat throwing away as free. That will encourage recycling correctly so. Mm-hmm. But now you're raising a separate point, which is the more expensive the cost of, th- of landfill space is and the more you impose that cost on the, on the consumer, which is from an economist viewpoint a good thing, you also have to enforce – the landfill and th- and garbage into the landfill as opposed to people who are dumping illegally. And explain what you mean by that. Well, suppose we say that uh, if you want to throw away an old washing machine, it's going to cost you 25 bucks. I have a pickup truck. I just back up into some vacant lot and push the washing machine off rather than pay the 25 bucks. And in fact, I might specialize at this. I could say, this is Munger's... Um, disposal service, and I will take your washing machine for $5. And you think, it's magic. That's the magic of the market. How can he do that? Well, no, I'm cheating. I'm just taking him and dumping him into some lot and pocketing the $5 instead of spending the $25 that it costs. Uh, and let's suppose that I've made up the 25 but it actually costs $25 to put it into a landfill. It's a fairly large thing. Um, I'm cheating. It's possible for me to cheat the system. And take to take another extreme, uh, you know, if you go get your oil changed at your local uh, oil change place, they charge a fee to dispose of your uh, used oil envir- in an environmentally friendly way. If they then go and pour it down the sewer drain, uh, they make a profit because they save their disposal costs and they pocket your so-called uh, fee. Right. If you, if you charge me and I change the oil myself, then I just dump it down under the curb. Right. And so we don't want that to happen. That's bad. That allows people to impose costs on others mm-hmm. in, in the form of pollution. So, so we, But the, the problem there is we're not getting prices right. We're not. It, it's difficult to get those prices right. How do we solve that problem? I had a girlfriend when I was in graduate school that instead of changing her oil, she was very concerned about the environment. Instead of changing her oil, she would just add oil every once in a while, and then when the car broke, she'd buy a new engine. Hmm. That's so, a very unusual technique. <laughs> She never recycled the oil. She was very concerned about that oil having to go into the environment. Uh-huh. She just was going to destroy her car. It, 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 no matter how much it costs. 
Well, you know, if you really don't like oil, the best thing to do is not to have a car, I guess would be the the, the easiest solution to that, uh-huh. but, which I guess she eventually got there. Right. <laughs> the, 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 but the point is, if we get prices right, the, the, the price of recycling that oil is not infinite. It's Correct. a couple of dollars. Can we find a way of of making it cheap enough? And one thing that you might do is charge a little bit extra on the front end for the disposal of batteries or washing machines or oil. And in fact, that's exactly what we do for a lot of things. So that it's not that this problem can't be solved. It's a, it's a question of getting prices right. So batteries, you charge $3 on the front end, and then when I take an auto battery in, I get a $3 credit. Okay, so let's, well, let's go back to the curbside now. And now you, sarcasm is allowed if necessary. Okay. We'll go back, we'll go back to, to that case. So in my case, uh, we don't sort. Uh, I put a bin out on the street. I've always thought you were out of sorts, in fact. <laughs> my bin out on the street has cans, bottles, uh, milk milk jugs. Um, I have newspapers in a different bin. That's the only sorting I do. But let's just take that bin that's got the uh, the green glass, the plastic, the reg- clear glass, and the cans. Uh-huh. Um, that stuff, people don't pay me to take it away. I have to pay someone implicitly through my taxes to have it taken away. What is the cities, what are most cities in America doing with that stuff? Well, they're making a choice. It depends how politically constrained they are. First thing that most cities do is, since they're so pressed for a budget, they're saying, what's the cheapest way we can get rid of this stuff? Now, the cheapest way you can get rid of aluminum is to give it to someone in pretty large quantities, and they'll pay you for it. So that's really cheap because they'll pay you for it. That's a moneymaker for the city. And yep, and in fact, they use that to subsidize the rest of the recycling program in some cases. They make enough money on that that the money they lose on the rest of the recycling program, it looks like it doesn't have a very big budget impact. Newsprint is about a wash uh, quite a bit of... Now, that, this isn't true for catalogs and color paper, but for, for newsprint, um, you can recycle that, and if you can, if you can get it sorted... Um, And in pretty large amounts, you can make a little bit of money on newsprint. There's two kinds of plastic. Um, PET, which is the the clear kind that we use for soft drink bottles, and HDPE, which is the kind you use for milk jugs. Both of those are pretty big net losers. Um, So the city's always looking for some way of either, if if it's commingled at all, if if, even a little bit, or if there's any sort of... uh, stuff still left in it. Uh, ketchup is ketchup bottles are PET. Um, it's almost useless. It means that if the, the, the contaminants make it garbage, not a resource. And so the, the city might landfill that depending on how much it costs them, or they may pay extra if they're forced to for political reasons. And I'm, you can't see I'm making quote marks in the air, but trust me, I'm making quote marks in the, in the air. They'll recycle it by paying extra to have it melted down and used as plastic. Now, those come out of – those type of bottles are, I think, derived from petroleum, right? Uh-huh. So as, as crude oil gets more expensive, shouldn't it become more reasonable to recycle those literally to do it correctly? I have a prediction. Yes. 100 years from now, there will be large plastic strip mining operations because plastic burns – has more petroleum content than crude oil. Not as much as gas, not as much as kerosene. Say but that again? The, suppose that there's a bunch of plastic in landfills. We're throwing away plastic in landfills. And the reason is that it's too expensive to reuse it as plastic. Okay. Well, if you've ever burned plastic, you notice it burns really well. It's mostly petroleum. Hmm. So the best use for plastic is to burn it as a fuel. But it's not worth it now. It's not worth it now, but... In 100 years. One of the complaints about plastic is it's not biodegradable. Oh, wait, that means it'll still be here in basically the same form. So large quantities of plastic will be mined by future generations because it'll be used as fuel. In fact, we're close to the point now where some municipal um, operations in the north, if they can get the plastic pure enough, could use it as a fuel. And if you have scrubbers, there actually is no impact on the environment. So is that recycling? No, not by most people's definition, because you're burning it. But it is, it's using it in a way that would, it's much cheaper than using it in landfills. Plastic is valuable precisely because it's not biodegradable. That's pretty cool. You're listening to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty, and I'm talking with Mike Munger of Duke University and longtime Econ Talk guest about the economics of recycling. 
So going back to the curb side, you're saying that some of the things that we put out at the curb have our resources, uh, the aluminum in enough quantities, sometimes newspaper, sometimes plastic, but not always. But some of the stuff we're putting out there is garbage that is not uh, viable as a, as a uh, productive activity to recycle. Let's talk about glass. Yes, please. Problem with glass is there's a number of kinds, and you can't tell by looking because it's clear. Actually, the differences aren't clear, I suppose. But colors, uh, it, it, for glass to be valuable, it has to be sorted by color and type. It's almost impossible to sort by type, and that reduces the value. You might be able to sort by color, except the darn glass breaks. So as long as you can have it in whole pieces, and if the glass itself is clean, um, it might be possible to reduce it to what's ground glass is called cullet, C-U-L-L-E-T. And if the cullet or ground glass is pure, it may have some value. But in particular, most cities have found that the quantities of green cullet, that is glass that's made from ground up green bottles, is that there's so much of it compared to the demand for making more that ground green cullet is actually sand. It's not as useful as clear virgin sand for making glass. So it's much more, uh, it's wasteful to recycle that collet into a new bottle. It's, it's, it's better for the earth to go get well, some yeah, new let, sand. Let's be specific. It actually uses more resources to recycle green glass than it does to make new green glass out of sand. So I guess I'm going to play environmentalist here. Interesting role for me. I, love, <laughs> I do love the environment, but I'm going to play the environmentalist who doesn't know economics. And I'm going to say, but Mike, that's, that's, that's stupid. Come on. The sand is in the earth right now. It's finite. So every time you make a new bottle out of sand, you're using up an irreplaceable resource. Whereas the collet, okay, it costs more to make it into a bottle, but that's just that's sustainable development. Why would I ever want to deplete something that's finite, which is the sand or the crude oil in the case of our other example, or trees in the case of th – those are real things. Those are precious things. How could it be wise to ever use those things instead of stuff we've already taken out of the earth and, and snatched from the bosom of, of Mother Earth? I, I'm willing to believe that if you can show me that it's actually cheaper. The, the problem with green glass when but I that's, – But that's because you're an economist. You just look at everything in dollar and cents, sarcasm on. You're an economist. You just <laughs> well, look it's, at – It's a fair argument. What you're saying is isn't there some other measure of value? And it's at that point that I usually want people to say, all right, maybe there is. What would it be? How, how can it be that since it's more expensive for me to melt down this green glass, because and the properties that it has means I have to melt it at a much higher temperature, and it releases toxins and colors that are very difficult and expensive to retrieve. Now, it's, it's true that there might be some other things that I can do with this green glass that will cost less if you'll let me treat it as garbage. I can use it as the sand that we use in concrete. I can make roads out of it. There's all sort because it's not biodegradable, precisely because these chemicals right now are trapped in the glass. If I heat them, they'll be released. But they're trapped in the glass. If I can use it as an inert material that's not biodegradable, well, consider, suppose we're making a roadbed. Do we want to make the roadbed out of banana peels and coffee grounds or out of ground glass? Ground glass is an excellent way, is, 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 a, is a terrific roadbed. If you'll let me use it that way, it's a lot cheaper. If you say, I have to reuse it as glass, then I, I just can't. Now, the interesting thing is that cities all over the United States stopped taking green glass because it's just too expensive. It, it costs too much to make stuff, or to put it another way, if I reuse the green glass, if I recycle it, then the stuff is worth less. I, I can't sell it for as high a price. Okay, but I'm going to put my environmentalist hat on again who doesn't know economics. Well, that's just because cities are, are – they're just stupid. Cities look at the wrong thing. They're worried about their budget. They shouldn't worry about their budget. They should just reuse stuff because that's better for the, uh, for the earth. It, just because it hurts their budget, that's a bad reason to not recycle it. And, and it pleases people to think that. And what, so what What's wrong they, with that argument? Again, I don't know what measure of value they're trying to use, 
But the, the interesting thing, I think, is that exactly that argument has been used all over the United States, and here's what cities do. They say, okay, you win. We'll recycle the green glass. And so in your, I guess you said it was blue, you put out in your, your blue container, you put out the green glass, and so the guy sorts it, and he puts it in a green glass container. So it's handled two or three more times than if you just put it out in the garbage bags. He puts it, he puts it in the green glass container. When they get to the landfill, they take the green glass container out of the recycling truck, and they put it into the landfill. It's so expensive they can't possibly afford it without charging extra. Okay, and, and I think what the environmental, environmentalist who, who's not an economist and probably some environmentalists who are economists and probably some economists who are environmentalists would argue is, well, it's true it uses more resources to turn that green glass back into a bottle than starting from scratch. But, to quote your friend from Massachusetts, it's worth it. True, it costs more, but it's worth it. Uh-huh. And so they're right. It, okay. it is worth it because it's become a political and religious question and not an economic question. And by well, economic, you mean we should say it, – it, this is a tricky thing. I, I always fight people use the word economic to mean financial. In this case, economic means both. Financial, it's about the monetary aspects of it, but it's also about the trade-offs and choices, mm -hmm. which is what I think we really should reserve the word economic for. Right, and well, that was why when I, when I – said you said should before i said it was a moral question i'm happy to have a utilitarian definition of should i think it's a defensible one we just need to recognize when we're making that kind of argument and not just the tautology that it's cheaper but i think you could argue and i think I, i'm trying to get at the um the more hardcore environmentalist mindset i think the more hardcore environmentalist mindset rejects the economic idea of trade-offs and says that i can't compare the resources that are used to convert uh, green glass into a new bottle versus the resources that are used to start from scratch. Those two things are not comparable. I don't want to hear about a trade-off between those two things uh -huh. because one of those things, which is the, the sand that comes from the earth, there's something holy about that and pristine and precious, whereas burning up people's time, that's just, you know, that's different. I can't put an economic – I can't put a financial – excuse me. Let me restate it. Using the calculus of dollars and cents to be able to compare and weigh those two things is not right. Uh -huh. Economist says, no, that's what we do. We got to do that. Otherwise, we can't tell when we're wasting or destroying versus building up and producing. I think some people say – I don't want to call them environmentalists anymore. Let me just call them the non-economist. The non-economist says, I reject that calculation. You cannot add the cost of the time it takes to recycle because it's always worth it. And my answer to that, and let's see what you think. My answer to that is, okay, like you say, that, that's a legitimate viewpoint. But just be aware that that's what you're saying when you say recycle at any cost. There's no amount of resources, natural or human, that I'm going to devote to this product it's, it still won't be worthwhile when we're done. It's always worth it. Mm -hmm. That's a legitimate viewpoint. I reject it. I yeah, reject I happen to, that I happen viewpoint. to disagree with it. And why? It, I, well, the reason I disagree with it is that it's an invocation of values that I don't share. But suppose you share those values, then that might very well be a persuasive argument. All I'm trying to say is there's most people, when they think of recycling, the reason they feel virtuous is they think they're saving resources. They're not. Now, if you think that it's so important that there's a disparity between the real value of virgin resources just because it's the earth and hasn't been touched before, or recycled materials, that even if they're more expensive, that the fact that we've already used those means that we're better off using, that, that, that that's, that's somehow better for the earth, that's a fair point of view. I just don't know what basis we would have for saying that. No, but I think it is a matter of personal preference, and I think you're right that I th the reason we're doing this podcast is to try to make clear this distinction, which is not, I think, clear to most people. It's more clear to economists than to non-economists. Usually, though, people will argue with me about the economics. If you want to argue about the economics, we can have an interesting discussion. Correct. And there's a, there was a famous article in the New York Times Magazine by John Tierney, 1996, and the title of it was Recycling is Garbage. 
and um, he, the, he begins the article by talking about these these school children that were being inculcated with the values that recycling is always better. Um, and it doesn't matter how much it costs. And so they were going through bags of garbage, and one of them found half of a manila folder. And she said, it's a shame. It's, a, it's just a crime that somebody threw this away because they could reuse it. And somebody else said, well, it's only half. And he says, yes, but if we look, if we look long enough, we can find the other half. <laughs> it doesn't matter how much time it takes us. It's better to reuse this than to go to a tree farm which is explicitly for the purpose of paper and cut down trees grown to make paper to make new paper. It doesn't matter how much time it takes. My no. view is that time is our most valuable and scarce resource. We can't make any more of that. There are trade-offs, but the, the, to say that it doesn't matter how much time it takes because being human, we have all the time we'll ever need. It's just uh, that's a value I disagree with. Yeah, I, I disagree with it too, but... I Here's, I think, the, the puzzle. Puzzles, the puzzle is I think everyone disagrees with that in other contexts outside of recycling and even in the context of recycling. What's fascinating about this is the social, cultural aspects of it and how they intermingle with the economics. Let's step back for a minute and me make the observation that what's incredible about recycling is that you semi-jokingly, but I think semi-seriously said at the beginning of this podcast – that when you're taking out your recycling, you pause, hoping your your neighbors will see you doing, I'm this, totally serious. doing I'm, this virtuous task. I'm totally serious, yes. And, and that's the beauty, by the way, of the yellow bin. It's bright, and so yeah. everyone can see that your yellow bin is out, and it's and it's got some stuff in it, but not too much because you don't want to burden the recycling <laughs> operation too much. So we this this phenomenon, this phenomenon that that recycling is virtuous, is real. In that many, many people would feel guilty if they didn't do that, and they feel good when they do do it. And that is an incredible emergent cultural value that, that got created through a very decentralized uh, cultural movement. And the only other examples that I know of that have been successful like that are anti-smoking, and mm -hmm. anti-littering, anti-littering being somewhat similar. That's, that's, that's insensitive. You should say environmentally challenged. Uh, which is environmentally challenged? The, uh, lit you shouldn't call them a litter bug. It's too judgmental. You oh. can just say that person is environmentally Correct. challenged. Correct. So it, when I was a boy, uh, many people were environmentally challenged. Uh -huh. Many people littered and didn't feel bad about it. It was just what you did. When you were riding down the highway and you had a popsicle, mm -hmm. you threw the wrapper out and you didn't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Today, to do that is to be a pariah. And we have become acculturated to be careful about litter. But the, the, the progression that you're talking about, I think, is fascinating. Let's focus on that for just a second. Okay, I'm walking along, and I've got an aluminum can, and I finish it, and I throw it on the ground. Somebody is likely to berate me. Right. And I can understand that. I'm putting that can on the ground. It has external effects. Imposing you know, the, costs the litter on makes others. everybody worse off. It's ugly. Okay, it's now, step man. two. I'm walking along, I have an aluminum can, I finish it, and I throw it into the garbage. And now, someone berates me. <laughs> now they berate you still. You're right. And, and why? Because you didn't recycle it. Is the can valuable? If it is, all they have to do is reach in, get the can, and go sell it themselves. They're not saying the can's valuable. They're saying that the value of recycling is a moral imperative as big as not littering, even though not littering has clear external effects. True. So I, I think the, the I actually have I, I have to admit I have a perverse joy in doing this. A lot of times in class, in, 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 if I'm teaching an economics class, when I finish my aluminum can of Diet Coke, I'll throw it into the garbage, and there's this gasp. <gasps> yeah, really? I can't believe you did that. And I'll say, well, do, do you guys do you care about recycling? Is it a deep value for you? And they'll say, yes, they'll not, because it's a religious experience. And I'll say, well, make sure one of you on the way out get that and go recycle it then. And then you can get the pleasure, right. Actually, just offer it up to them. Yeah. Yeah, I could just say, who, who wants this? Who, who wants it? Who wants the privilege of being able to recycle they should, this? They, I hadn't thought about that. They might bid. Somebody might pay me a quarter. Yeah, for, to get the, the uh, honor. Um, so we've come to this world where this is, you know, whether it's good or bad, it is the way people feel, which I find fascinating. But equally fascinating is it's not the way they feel about everything else. So just to take some silly examples that I think dramatize the, the point, uh, I don't darn my socks. When I get a pair of socks that has a hole in them, I throw them out. Um, 50 years ago, 
I think most people darn their socks. Now we're sufficiently wealthy that most people don't. There are probably still some people who do, or they wear the socks with a hole in them, even though it's slightly uncomfortable or slightly embarrassing. But it, it, the, 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 value, the cost of socks has fallen dramatically exactly. in real terms. So it, it, we all understand that the time it takes to turn the sock into its usable state is not worth it. It's better to buy new socks. Again, as you point out, because time is precious. Almost universally, yes. But, so we all understand that. That's totally rational. And there's thousands of things we do all the time where we say, the time that it costs to turn this back into a usable item simply isn't worth it. Um, We make, for example, after we have a turkey or a chicken, we usually take the bones and make a soup out of it Mm because I like what the soup tastes like. Mm -hmm. If That took a very long time, or it became something that took longer and longer. I'd stop doing it, and I'd throw the bones out. We all all make those choices constantly, making trade-offs between the costs and the benefits. Mm -hmm. Somehow, cans, bottles, and newspaper enter their own space, their own dimension that is not like the socks or the turkey carcass or the thousands of other things that we – very automatically make rational trade-offs between the resources it takes to convert into something useful versus throw it out. And those things, I mean, here's another example. Your TV breaks. You don't fix it. Not anymore. In 1950, 1960, you fixed it because TV repair was cheaper and a new TV was expensive. Mm -hmm. That calculus makes it really easy to go get your TV fixed. Most people today, when their TV breaks, or their computer, or their iPod, or hundreds of other things, the microwave oven. There's no, as you say, it's a great example. Your microwave oven, when it breaks, is it's either garbage or it's a resource. Well, it's garbage because mm-hmm. the, the costs of getting it repaired, quote, aren't worth it. We all understand that. We all behave that way. We don't demand that the city subsidize microwave repair people to make sure we never throw out a microwave again. We recycle our cars constantly until they get to a point where it's not worth it. We're constantly repairing our cars because uh-huh. there it's worth it. And yet with these these weird little household items called bottles, cans, and, and newspaper, that calculus somehow is gone. Now it's just no matter what the cost is. It, 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 How did we get to that point? It's interesting that it isn't quite gone because – I think that I thought that there was an, an urban legend. In fact, when I first started researching this, I was sure it wasn't true. Um, but I had heard that some people would run their recycling through the dishwasher before they would put it out. And I thought that that's that's crazy. There's no way that they would run garbage through the dishwasher. Now, I myself um, sometimes use Cool Whip or plastic containers or maybe mayonnaise jars. I need to clean those out. I might run those through the dishwasher because I'm going to reuse them to hold. Um, Store soup, other things, yeah. Or I'm going to – mayonnaise jars make excellent holders for screws and washers. There's, so it, and it needs to be clean. If I'm going to reuse it, yeah, I'm going to clean it. But why would you run it through the dishwasher before you then are going to go put it out in the recycle? And if there's an interesting answer. I actually found several cities that explicitly on their websites suggest that you run all of your jars and plastics – through the dishwasher before putting it into the recycle container. Why? The so answer use up, is... Use, up, use water, use electricity, oh, use it's, your it's time. Yours, it's not theirs. Use your you, time. You can change garbage into resource by running it through the dishwasher and paying those costs of time and resources yourself. If those jars are clean, it's much closer to being a resource for the city, even though it's garbage to you. question is, why would you do it? It doesn't make sense for anyone to do it. I can see why the city might say it. It's expensive for the city to clean out the mayonnaise jar, but if you'll do it, then it's a resource to them because now the glass is clean. The question is, why would you feel virtuous about wasting all of the hot water energy and time of running that through? And many cities actually have on their websites, make sure that you run this through the dishwasher or else rinse it thoroughly before putting it basically in the garbage kind of an incredible thing. So, the, the, But the, 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 in terms of the distinction we've been talking about, the city wants you to take garbage and turn it into a resource. The question is, is it, is it worth anything to you? You get nothing for it. And just, yet we do it. We just line up like sheep and do it. Some of us. Um, <clears throat> I guess the question is, uh, sh- should you feel good about it? I, and again, I think part of the answer is, I think people have make a moral distinction between new stuff versus old stuff. Uh, so it's one thing to use the elect- – in our minds, slightly irrational, 
using electricity and using water and using soap. But the, and these using, are the same people that are putting fluorescent bulbs in all of their sockets to try to save electricity. Correct. They're just going to burn it elsewhere. They're going to burn it uh, running garbage to the dishwasher. It's a puzzle. It's a bit of a puzzle. It does it does creep into the realm of the religious, uh, which I think well, is... Well, I, I, I actually I, I just couldn't stand it, so I, I called. And I called a couple of these cities that said that you should run it to the dishwasher. And they, the, answer, the answer that they gave, I thought, was interesting because they said, well, you know, maybe it's not, because I made it sound self-interested. You know, you're just doing this, so it's cheaper to you to recycle. They say, no, no, we're trying to keep animals away from the recycle bins. But then it seems to me, if you're trying to keep animals away, then the real problem is the garbage. Why not run the turkey carcass through the dishwasher? There's all sorts of stuff that animals might like. Maybe you had a steak for dinner. Put that bone in the dishwasher. You've got to clean it. Now, what we need to do is before we throw things out, we need to hermetically seal them in uh, vacuum-packed containers. Make them as, as clean as possible. Yes. So they um, have a, a, a smaller impact on the environment. Or, or through the looking glass. Or even better. I think it's uh, we got to learn to eat the bones, um, <laughs> right? Bones well, are full of iron and all kinds of other if, good stuff. If, that, if you, you want to make soup with it, that's great. I do that also, but it's not because I think I'm saving the environment. I like the taste of soup. Yeah, it's a slightly different motivation. Uh, before we uh, end this podcast, and I should mention that it is based on an essay that – uh, that you've written for the uh, Library of Economics and Liberty website, and we'll put a link up to it at uh, for the link at the page for this podcast. Uh, before we close, I want to talk about diapers. Uh huh. Um, I have four children, and uh, you have how many? I have two boys. And when we had our first child, we decided uh, to go. Well, let me, let me let me tell the story a little differently. People would say to me. So have you decided to go with uh, disposables or uh, cloth diapers? And I'd always say, well, we care about the environment, so we're going to go with – and I wouldn't pause because I think once I said we're going to go with the – we care about the environment, I think people always filled in the phrase cloth diapers. Sure, but that's not what I would say. I would always say, well, we care about the environment, so rather than have little trucks – Put put putting around town, polluting, picking up all the diapers, and then using all those toxic detergents that has to that, to clean them. We're going to go with the disposables. Now there was an attempt to to compost. It was really a creative attempt to compost with disposables, but I think most people just merely throw them out. And the, some have argued that that is the environmentally uh, appropriate response. The cloth diapers. Even though they are, quote, reused, in the, given the resources it takes to reuse them, they have to use up resources. And so perhaps disposables are more friendly. But did you go that way? We used, um, I guess you'd call them recycled diapers. We used cloth diapers. And the reason was, for us, they were cheaper. There was a, a service that would come around, a, a little guy named Clyde. I remember him well. And I always thought... Uh, Thank goodness for this job, because it's not clear that Clyde would have had another kind of job otherwise. But he was well-suited for going and driving soiled diapers around. And he would pick it up, and it, it would cost us, I believe it was something like $29 a month. And I tried to add it up. It was a little bit cheaper, I think, than using the rather large number of diapers that my two healthy sons would have gone through if we had used um, disposables. The difference was it took a lot more of our time. Plus, we had these huge containers of soiled diapers that we had to keep around. I think in retrospect, I was doing that which I've criticized in others. I think it was irrational for me to think I was saving any resources by doing this. But the virtue that I felt was worth a great deal. I guess if you really cared about the environment, you wouldn't uh, give them back to Clyde. <laughs> You'd just keep using them. We, um, we, we, we could have washed them ourselves. Well, or, my parents did. When, when I, yeah, my, yeah. my, 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 my mom did too. And There was no service. You okay, just, but, but what has happened? What has happened to disposable diapers? The answer is they've become enormously cheaper, and the amount of plastic they contain has become smaller and smaller. The impact on the landfill today, compared to the nearly 20 years ago when I was doing this, the impact on landfills today is far less. And it's not because diaper manufacturers love us and want to do what is best for us. It's cheaper to make diapers with less plastic if you can find a way to do it. So the answer is dynamic. Yeah. If you want to save the earth, choose 
the, the alternative that uses fewer resources. How do you tell? It's cheaper. Yeah, and that, again, that calculus, the economist calculus, which is what we're uh, both, I think, you and I care about, uh, treats all resources equally. And well, you, you can't add them up. You can't add three apples and four oranges and say, well, okay, it uses seven, that's less. Different resources have different values. You need some way of adding them up. And that's what economists do. But I, I want to make it clear that that often is – the reaction to that is often, well, economists are just you know, green eye shade accountants. All they care about is money. Uh, it's not that we care about money. We care about everything. But we want to make sure that when we make any, a decision – that we make the decision that uses the least resources and, and for they, the value. We're the only people who care about everything because no one else has a way of transporting themselves between one kind of resource and another. We talk about trade-offs. A certain amount of one resource is worth a certain amount of another resource. And that is where the green eye shade part comes in, the accountant part, because we do want to assign a dollar value, but we're totally happy assigning a dollar value to time. And my claim is, is that you may deride that as some person might deride that as a as a crass and commercial uh, claim, a crass and commercial uh, um, way of of leading your life. But but my claim is it's the human way to lead your life. It's the right way. It is the humane way, because as you said earlier, our time is precious. It does not come back. And if you treat your time cavalierly, which is sometimes what uh, people advocate in these areas. You're giving away something that you cannot regain, and that is what is precious. That's time that could be spent with your family, time that could be spent volunteering, or time that could be spent reading a, a cheap novel, all, of, all three of which produce human satisfaction all in different amounts and in different values for others beside yourself. But th those are precious, and to ignore that resource and treat it as if it's worth zero, to tell people to make sure they wash out their mayonnaise jars by hand because the dishwasher doesn't really do a thorough enough job uh – -huh is to be anti-human, pro-Earth perhaps, uh, perhaps, but anti-human. And it, the economist viewpoint is to, is to throw the human part into the equation somehow, maybe imperfectly, but to include it. And it's imperative to include at, at it. At least we want to look at the, the sorts of trade-offs where we think the way that people can make themselves happy is by spending their time on the things that give them the most satisfaction. Um, coming up with a moral imperative that says, no, no, you have to spend it scrubbing out mayonnaise jars is anti-human. Yeah. And I just want to close with this strange thing. Again, I don't have an insight into it, and I don't know if anyone does. But again, in most areas, we don't behave as if our time is worth zero. We understand how precious our time is, and we shepherd it and conserve it and use great stewardship and care with our time. Uh, although sometimes we waste it. But in general, we, we appreciate the value of our time. It's only in these strange areas that have become culturally uh, highlighted that we uh, take our our time and treat it as if it were worth zero. Um, do you see any political forces that might change that down the road? Is that well, what I, do you think is going to happen? I think what's interesting is that having people at least begin to ask, why is it that as much the, the, the any time of resources that we spend on recycling is clearly better. Um, over time, if anything, I think the, the, there's been a, more of a there's been less satisfaction with recycling. Um, I'm afraid we actually we'll go too far the other way. I, I'm worried that we'll start to throw away things that actually do have value because people see through this kind of hocus pocus. If people tell you that you have to recycle for religious reasons, we're going to end up not recycling even for economic reasons, which is throwing out the recycled baby with the bathwater. So what are you suggesting, that we, that, that we might uh, not pay attention to the, the copper tubing in our house and that we might uh, throw out our car as a way of spiting uh, the environmental movement that, that's been becoming too uh, oppressive? If people yammer at you saying you should feel bad about not doing the thing that I happen to think is most important, all that matters then is if you don't share those values. And by values, I mean moral moral views. Instead of, let's try to do the thing that uses the least resources. We're actually environmentalists. Economists are environmentalists in the sense we'd like to conserve resources. We are the stewards of the environment. So the, the, there has to be some kind of middle path, not a political imperative to run turkey bones through the dishwasher. But 
let's recycle the things, let's reuse the things that actually do impose costs on the environment from, from using them in some other way. So this backlash worry, is the, it's sort of like um, uh, Stendhal, when he first tasted ice cream, supposedly said, what a pity this isn't a sin. <laughs> Meaning, you know, it tastes so great already. If it, if it were a sin, the pleasure would just be extraordinary. And so you're suggesting that if we make it enough of a moral imperative, uh, there's going to be a backlash where people will – We'll throw out stuff for the thrill of bucking the. Yeah, um, I'm, and I've, 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 I guess to my shame, I just described myself doing it. Um, I can really get a reaction by throwing away an aluminum can. Now, it's quite possible that afterwards I would look around and take it out myself because I really do feel kind of bad about not recycling aluminum. But yeah, you can get a reaction by not recycling. Um, and so, since we've defined it as something that that's moral. Um, well, recycling rates on all sorts of uh, products are declining. We're not doing better. We're doing worse. Hmm. Interesting. Do you use paper towels? Yes, I do. Shame on you. Do you leave the water running if you have to grab something out of the refrigerator? Not if I can manage it. But let right. me also say that I own 35 acres of forest land where I'm growing trees so that tomorrow's people will also have paper. Well, that's nice, Mike. I don't have anything virtuous. It was virtuous. for you that I did this. Yeah, I don't have anything virtuous to stack up against <laughs> my sins So on this front. So I guess I'm the one who's going to lose friends because of this podcast. But you, because of one, the yellow bin, yeah. two, the 35 acres of forest, do you have any – and and you do turn off the uh, the water. Do you turn off the lights uh, often when you leave the room? And I'm I'm I, I go everywhere and turn off lights. It, it really drives my wife crazy. In fact, I'll, I'll spend too much time um, – turning off the lights. But fortunately, she'll go right behind me because she'll say, wait, you left the dark on in here. <laughs> Why does she do that? <laughs> she likes it light. And yeah. in fact, as often is the case, uh, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. So well, we usually leave the lights on. We're thinking of going with candles or just enjoying the darkness. I uh -huh. think that's the next uh, frontier. <laughs> Why... Uh, why use that electricity when you could just get used to the dark? The dark has many virtuous things. It, and, it. It would, <laughs> and it would be far more virtuous of that not to use my electricity that way. That's true, too. My guest today has been Mike Munger of Duke University. Mike, thanks for joining us. It was great. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.